Swinging in the Rain is a, a compilation of all the capital crimes that took place in Genesee County from essentially 1807 to 1958. It's everybody who was convicted of uh, a murder that resulted in the death penalty sentence. And there were 11 altogether. Uh, eight were hung there in Batavia, and three were electrocuted over in Sing Sing. So I figured it was about time to go through one of my totes and gather all the notes and all the scrap pieces of paper I had and put it together so everybody knows exactly what happened. And what we do in the book is we follow not only the, the suspect, but we follow the victim. We tell about the trials and just some of the oddball little stories. And there were a few that followed each and every one of these cases. I've done a number of nonfiction on this area. The, the Linden Murder series is probably the, the best known. That, uh, but doing all that research, I, I found uh, people coming up to me and asking me to tell them about the execution that took place in 1830 or in 1871. I had nothing to tell them other than probably the executed person died. You know, <laughs> that wasn't a lot of information. But So I decided in, during my interim year just to put all the notes together and do a little private research. And we put together, I think, a nice little book for him. So. I, there was a favorite author I had as a kid, Arch Merrill, uh, who worked for the Democrat Chronicle at the time. And he did a lot of small town news, nonfiction stuff. And I kind of remember a lot of his early works because I read them as a kid. And doing my research, I see that a lot of, a lot of information has never been told about these uh, these cases, so I just figured it has to be out there. I'd like to tell them. I have the opportunity. I think I have a degree of talent, so I decided to combine it all together. So, uh, We're in Town Line Road just off Route 20 in the town of Darien, and in 1951, a high school student from Alexander High was walking down this road, and he saw a pair of tennis shoes, sneakers, on the side of the road, so he goes over to investigate, and just looking up real quick, he sees the body of a 15-year-old girl on, just on the other side of the fence. He goes to the neighbor, in short time, the coroner's here, the sheriff's here, everybody's here, state troopers. Uh, they put out a uh, notice that it was an unidentified 15-year-old female. Uh, well, there was a family up in Buffalo that had reported their 15-year-old daughter missing. They came down, they identified her, and within a 24-hour period, the suspect was in custody, and it turned out to be the young girl's uncle. She had he had come, he was a steel worker from Buffalo. There was a family problem, a fight, infighting. So he took her uh, out this way, hit her in the head with a rock. She was unconscious. He threw her body out in the middle of the town line road. And according to his own testimony, ran over the body half a dozen times. Got out, convinced she was dead, picked her up, threw her in the field where the young man found her the following morning. Yeah, uh, Charles Stokely. Some, I'll pro I'm probably miss mispronouncing it could be Stockley. And this was 1871. He was a farmhand. Uh, he worked for John Welker. Uh, he owned a sizable piece of farm property up near what today is GCC campus. Now this Mr. Stockley was madly in love with the farmer's daughter and she had wanted nothing to do with him. And when she shot down his proposal, her father laughed at this man. Uh, being laughed at was not something he really appreciated, so he walked back into town. And near what today is the penny saver, there was a little, probably, pawn shop, jewelry shop, and he bought a pistol there, walked back to the Welker property, and shot the man three times. The third shot being fatal, it went, went through his brain. Put the, pocket, put the gun back in his pocket and walked back downtown. But by then, the word had spread that Welker had been shot, and this was the guy who did it. And he was quickly apprehended. Um, what was really bizarre was he was in jail awaiting conclusion of the trial. He wrote a letter to Mrs. Welker, the, the widow, saying, would you come please bail me out? I want to come work the farm for a while. I need some money. That was probably one of the most bizarre things I read is he wanted to be bailed out by the widow. I would say Stephen Lewis uh, in 1958. Uh, he killed an Arthur Einhauer up in Elba, and right out in his front yard, shotgun blast to the chest. Nobody knew where the shot came from because it was, uh, stri it was deer season, so it could have been a stray round. So the authorities came to the house. Uh, they said, your, your husband's certainly dead, and he's shot dead by the, by the car. Uh, he goes in, talks to the wife, then the phone rings. And as a gentleman from Rochester said, just tell her she'll be, everything's gonna be okay now. Everything's gonna be okay. 
uh, the smart deputy said, well, let's trace this call. And the phone went back to Stephen Lewis's place in, in Rochester. He went up there and questioned him. It turned out that at one point, when the deceased and his wife were separated, Mr. Lewis and Mrs. Einhauer had an affair. Oh, this young Mr. Lewis could not quite get over that he was, the affair was over. And the authorities believed, well, I don't think Mrs. Anhauer believed it's quite over either. And they really believed that she had something to do with it, and they held her as, as a witness uh, for a number of months. She was held in the Genesee County Jail along uh, with Stephen Lewis. Now, the, the district attorney kept talking to Mr. Lewis, said, what do you know about this woman? He says, I know nothing about her and never had anything to do with her. But Mr. Lewis wasn't the brightest uh, light bulb in the box. He, he wrote a love letter to Mrs. Anheyer, just a couple jail cells over, and it was delivered by the sheriff. So he, his credibility as far as saying he knew nothing about the, the widow kind of was quickly thrown out the window. That humanity really hasn't changed. Uh, in, you know, the same... Uh, mindset of someone in 1807 or in 1830. There, there's a case that occurred in 1830, and I'll back up, a, go a little further, and even in 1871, a, a gentleman, severely drunk, uh, assaulted a 75-year-old woman. And he said, I don't remember doing it. You can do a Google search and find any number of cases like that today. You know, it, there were three love triangle cases that I came across. Two, I'm pretty convinced that the women were directly involved in what happened in the outcome of the, the story. Those really hadn't changed. The stories are still the same. You know, murder's done for, for what, whatever the motive is. You know, uh, love, money, revenge. It, in a lot of these cases, it turned out to be just revenge and love.